Bye. Thank you, John. What a nice introduction. What a nice introduction. It's going to be hard to just live up to that. How do we get the slides going here? Um, someone want to help? Here we go. Um, welcome. I first want to thank the students who put Net Impact together. When I first heard about it last year, I had no idea that it was this significant. But it's an amazing force that you all have gathered here in Nashville. I was at a conference at Yale on Monday. And the person sitting next to me said, oh, you're from Nashville. I'm going down to Net Impact. Uh, the flight down from Baltimore, uh, Georgetown students were on the plane, excited about Net Impact. And I think it's been a remarkable series of presentations. So thanks for coming to Nashville. And I hope this can add to your list. I'm planning on being a little controversial, uh, like a bull in a china shop. We're going to break some pottery today. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. This will not be politically correct. If I've done my job, I will have offended most everybody in the room. That's not good for my political career, probably. But I hope it will stimulate your thought. Uh, there are a number of areas that I've crossed over the years that I think do not get sufficient attention. And I will admit I'm subjective. I'm even prejudiced. But I look forward to your input. Let me also mention that uh, Lisa Quigley is in the audience. Lisa, where are you? Right there. Uh, I'm between chiefs of staff right now. And Lisa is actually kind enough to. Uh, be interested in the position. She's a veteran chief of staff on Capitol Hill. She'd worked for Cal Dooley, who's one of the more notable but low profile members of Congress of our generation. Uh, Cal, unfortunately, decided to retire, but uh, I wanted Lisa to see what it's like when I talk to students. She might determine that I'm way too controversial to be a politician, because even though I have been elected, I'm one of 30 people in all of American history to represent two different congressional districts. Uh, sometimes you can push the limits of uh, public understanding too far. Let's see if we do that today. Okay, the first slide that some of you will probably hate is this. Uh, but this is my beef with not just your generation, but mine too. Most of the great jobs are basically exploiting other people's financial ignorance. Most of my class at Harvard Law School went on to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, firms like that, and other firms. And the core business plan was basically this. That, to me, is not something to be proud of. Now, I haven't made $400 million yet, like some of them have. <laughs> but there's got to be a higher aim. The I win, you lose game. This is a list that probably is controversial. You can always say, well, it's good to extend credit to folks who would not have been credit worthy otherwise. But if you look down this list, I think I can pretty much prove to you that there's a seductive wrong in almost each one of these approaches. For example, take something uncontroversial like auto leasing. I ask you, would the big three auto companies in Detroit have made so many bad cars if their true profit center had been in manufacturing for all these decades instead of in car financing? You know, GMAC and Primus have basically carried those auto companies for a long time and diverted them, in my opinion, from their core business of making great cars. There are other things that may, I mean, this one you probably never heard of. We're wrestling that in legislation right now. Henry Waxman, who may be the greatest legislator of our generation, has said it's the most wasteful and corrupt program in all of federal government. You as taxpayers are paying $5 billion a year to subsidize an industry that calls itself crop insurance, but it isn't even insurance. So why do we? let them get away with living a lie like that. Because they contribute a million dollars or so a year to the agriculture committees. That's why we do it. Why do so many people lobby Congress? Because it's cheap and it works. Money flows naturally in that direction. There are other things that we could get into. Uh, I worry that all folks, congressmen included, can't even handle the simple and seductive power of the credit card in your wallet. Because when the national savings rate is zero or negative, and the unpaid balance at 18 to 21 percent plus, it could be that that invention in 1965 we haven't begun to cope with yet. There are other things that you can look at uh, that you know we can have a debate on if you, if you want. I worry about this one. This is some of my colleagues, maybe myself one day, retiring with some of the last defined benefit plans left in America. Well. After we talk about what's going on in the economy, the real economy using real numbers, I think you'll wonder why anybody should get a big benefit and retire with that. 
look at this one. I hope that everybody at Net Impact and your friends will vote uh, religiously and vote ferociously every possible election. Because so much of the power isn't just at the federal level where all the cameras are. So much of the real power is state and local. And that's where really the most attention is needed. And yet due to the media distraction, you're oftentimes influenced into thinking the power is in Washington. This is a famous saying from a century ago, a sucker born every minute. Everybody knows that. And we probably think less of P.T. Barnum for having told us the truth. MBAs know how to make new suckers. That was a great, bold innovation in the graduate business school market. So what do you have? One natural sucker plus one man-made sucker, you double the market size. You can't do better than that, right? But is that something to be proud of? The key question is this. It's a variant of the golden rule. Would you buy what you are selling? Probably not. How many of y'all heard Chad Holliday, the head of DuPont, in the keynote earlier? I don't know if he told you this, like he told us at lunch, that 20 years ago there was a meeting at DuPont. Greenpeace had unfurled a banner saying that DuPont's the number one polluter. And somebody at DuPont headquarters said, Greenpeace is right. That was a brave soul. He didn't give us the details about how long that person's career lasted. He was probably fired immediately. But still, the truth stuck. Would you buy what you were selling? I once had a fight with the head of Champion Paper Company because they were doing terrible pollution on a stream in East Tennessee. And I asked him where his vacation home was. It was on some pristine lake in the state of Maine. You know, no pollution had ever touched that lake. I said, well, I'll start believing your arguments a lot more that this is a clean creek in East Tennessee when your vacation home is located right on the creek. Then you'll be living what you're telling me. But of course, that didn't fit his vacation plans. This is, to me, the balance. We need personal responsibility. We also need some paternalism. And that can come from government. It doesn't have to. It's a lot better if industry self-police. It's much better if professions self-police, because we forget the definition of profession in America. You know, most everybody, even physicians and the folks we think are professionals, end up being employees because they don't self-police. They don't care. They're so lazy and undisciplined, they expect an outside disciplinarian. So we need to learn how to swim, but also somebody should be keeping the sharks out of the pool. And I'm worried that's precisely what we're not doing at the regulatory level. Like, why should there be lead in any toy in the United States of America? Who fell down on that job? The Consumer Product Safety Commission, the big brand name toy companies, the manufacturers in China or other nations, but that's something I thought we had cured decades ago. But we haven't. Now, the average B student tells me, look, we're just looking for a job. You know, these other things, justice, that's somebody else's problem. You know, you don't learn altruism. Google, who would turn down a job there? You know, especially for a government job. Well, as wonderful as Google is, as high as the market cap is, and I'm proud that their stock's over $700, Government of the greatest country in the history of the world has a lot more power than Google. And we need your help in government. A lot of folks just think they can own one, and if not a bureaucrat, a politician. There's a former senator named John Bro from Louisiana who said, you can't buy my vote, but you can rent it. He didn't discuss leasing arrangements, but that was a well-known and humorous remark, only there's too much truth in it for it to be really funny. I don't know, any Ayn Rand fans here, audience? To me, and this isn't a nice way to call it, but it's basically pornography for capitalists. If you read the stuff, it basically advocates free love, you know, but you don't hear Alan Greenspan bragging on that in his biography. Uh, so, but I know so many people, and you see bumper stickers around here in Nashville, you know, uh, long live John Galt, you know, I am John Galt. There's a Jane Galt now who's a blogger. You know, hopefully we won't be diverted by that. There are different viewpoints. You know, some people are automatically anti-government and just assume it combines the worst aspects of the post office and the IRS. But more liberal-minded people say, hey, they don't like the marketplace. I'm not treating them fairly. And if you'll remind me, you know, we need to talk about stagnant median wages in America over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Cash wages. That's an amazing tragedy for our country because productivity's gone up. Most markets have gone up. Why is median pay so 
resistant to change? Well, the reason is that compensation has gone up appropriately, but cash wages have not. What's compensation? It's fringe benefits plus cash. Most of fringe benefits are health care. And health care is by far the most tax favored fringe benefit going. It's $200 billion a year that we're spending of your taxpayer money to subsidize that. So it's almost as if there's a giant vacuum cleaner that sucks everybody's pay raise and puts it over in the health care sector. But it's kind of an invisible vacuum cleaner that we'll get into in a little bit. And no one even knows it's working. You can't hear its roar. But that's an amazing thing to take everybody's pay raise in America on average over 30 or 40 or 50 years and put it in one sector. What if we'd done that for education? You know, as all campuses would look as nice as Vanderbilt. You know, it's an amazing machine that we have built. And guess what? Congress never passed a law to do this. It's all a World War II fluke that we allowed to perpetuate and grow like kudzu. We can go into the details of that if you'd like. But this to me is the American dream. America is about climbing the ladder, being upwardly mobile, giving everybody not a guarantee or a head start, but a chance. Just living here should guarantee that, but we're, it's, it's not necessarily like it used to be. There are a number of folks who would love to glue your feet to the floor or keep you on that treadmill forever. I'm thinking here especially of subprime. When you're paying two or three hundred percent interest a year, how are you going to get off that treadmill? And the perfect customer is one that is just self-disciplined enough to avoid bankruptcy and just disciplined enough to keep on working their hearts out for you. Elizabeth Warren, a professor at Harvard, has a wonderful proposal. You know, use, usury laws are hopelessly outmoded, antique, they're anti-capital markets. But she says, how about if we have usury laws, but let's let the usurers pick the interest rate so we can accommodate whatever they would like to charge. And you will discover that their preferred cap on interest rates is well over three or four hundred percent a year because that's the return on their money. That's not a good situation for you to be in. One reason you are business students is to avoid the slavery that John Maynard Keynes described. You know, he was the great British economist, and one of his most famous phrases was that we are all the slaves of some defunct economist. And we should not be the slaves of defunct economists or third-rate businessmen, but so many people are. When you see immigration flows around the country, and the University of Michigan has done great work on this, because any static map that you see is an illusion. Maps should be about people, not boundaries. Most geographical boundaries are a historical fluke anyway. Population flows are really what matters. And if you look at the Michigan maps of the world, you will see a huge bulge for America as everybody's trying to get in. And other countries shriveled like raisins as everybody tries to get out. So if you chart the path of human capital, it's amazing what flows will show. You know that from economics, any static model is basically primitive. It takes a dynamic model to show what's really going on. Well, maps are a static model. Population flows are a real model. And so often the folks who are first to move are the best people in society. The most energetic, the most optimistic, the most hardworking, the folks that we dearly or should dearly love to have in this country but sometimes it's hard to get out. And in general, what they're seeking is a better way of life. What is government? I've encountered more misunderstandings from my B school students about this than any other topic. Because most people, you're raised to hate government. There's a very powerful guy in uh, Washington called Grover Norquist. He has a power breakfast every Wednesday morning. All the Republican operatives are there. He has a very bitter outlook toward the world. And as one of the commentators said, he was my brother's classmate at Harvard, he said when his father took him out for ice cream when he was a kid, his father would take a few licks off the cone himself and hand it to Grover and say, that's what government does to you. To me, that sounds like child abuse, but still, you know, <laughs> I would have a bitter and distorted view of the world if I'd grown up like that too. But government is basically when you go out to eat dinner, say with your friends, you go Dutch, and how many times have you gone to dinner with your friends and they put in too much money? It rarely, if ever, happens. There's some instinct in the human brain that basically says, look, you forget you have the steak, and everybody else had, you know, hamburger steak. 
you forget that you had the two drinks for dinner or the extra dessert or the nice wine and everybody else got beer and you don't put up your fair share. You know, an economist would call it the free rider uh, syndrome. But we face it in government all the time. And that's what government is. It's basically the corralling effort to get people to pay their fair share. Not any more, but not any less either. And how many people remember the poor waitress or waiter? You're often working for minimal wages. So government is when you're eating with your friends and when you're eating with folks who are not your friends, but who live across town or across the nation. And somehow we have to make it work all together. And the miracle of America is somehow we have made it work. What's well, federal government? This is a description from a former Bush uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, Assistant Secretary, a guy named uh, Peter Fisher, who's now at BlackRock in New York. He's a wizard. He's the guy who helped bail out long-term capital. You can read about him on uh, the book When Genius Failed. He nearly lost his job over this speech. If the Bush administration had been more attentive, he would have, but they somehow overlooked this remark. What is federal government? It's a giant insurance company that's $70 trillion in the hole with a side business in defense, period. I've just described for you 90% of federal government. That's what we do. We're an insurance company. Well, you don't think about that. We're not like the Hartford or the Travelers or Aetna, but we are. Most of what we do is actuarially based and has nothing to do with what you read about Congress doing. It's all on automatic pilot. It's actuarially based because the giant programs are called Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid and veterans' pensions and benefits. And that's basically all an actuarially determined enterprise. And most congressmen, and get this, most business students are not equipped to understand that. How many business students even teach insurance? Hardly any. It's one of the great black box businesses of America. It's incredibly tax favored. They're arguably the strongest lobby in America because they got an exemption from congressional oversight in 1946. It's called the McCarran-Ferguson Act. And nobody's been brave enough to do anything about it. In theory, they're regulated at the state level. But I've been in the room when Tennessee picked two insurance commissioners. And who do you think they picked? Tough regulators of the industry hand-picked industry choices. The largest insurance company in Tennessee is by statute exempt from Tennessee regulation. So who are they regulated by? Not the feds, not the state, the city of Nashville? No. They're completely free of regulation. And I'm not saying the regulation is good, but the political muscle to get yourself out of any regulation ever is worrisome. This. Um, 70 trillion in the hole, we'll talk about this a little bit more. If you use real accounting, this is the sad conclusion. And this is such a terrific burden on your generation. I'm afraid I left the video in the car, but in 1989, a historical thing happened that's not recorded in most textbooks. That's the only time in history Congress has ever repealed an entitlement program. And we repealed it. It was called catastrophic health insurance because a few angry seniors in Chicago mobbed the car of a congressman named Danny Rostenkowski. He was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And because of that video footage so intimidated most of Congress, after 17 months of this program, we repealed it. It's gone. History. AARP had been for it, and AARP was against it. The historical lesson of that bill should have been that next time a bad entitlement program gets passed, the group that's affected should be involved. But like Sherlock Holmes, the dog that did not bark, your generation was not alert to what happened in 2003 when the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, this time Bill Thomas, passed an $8 trillion Medicare drug bill, completely unpaid for, arguably the most irresponsible bill ever passed in all of American history. And that's not me, a Democrat, saying this. This is the word of a Reagan Republican co economist, Bruce Bartlett. Eight trillion dollars, not a, an attempt to pay for it. And it passed by one vote, one or two votes in the House of Representatives. And there was a nobody in your generation alert enough to mob the car of Bill Thomas. But that might have been all it took to change the course of history. And your generation was asleep or AWOL or missing. This is a perfect time for a friendly takeover of your federal government. 
Over half of federal employees will be retiring. A lot of folks came into government inspired by John F. Kennedy. They're getting up in years now. Uh, they need to be replaced. Who's going to replace them? D and F students who never went to graduate school? Or hot shots like y'all who have a business brain and also a compassionate heart? I would love to see wholesale numbers of net impact folks come in to these government agencies clean them up, to straighten them out, to get things right again. Because your federal government is atrophying. It is arteriosclerosis. Some parts of it are dying, often due to incompetence. People have forgotten what their mission is anymore. You might think this is an exaggeration. Most large government programs are collapsing. Well, that's the 70 trillion hole I was talking about. We'll get into that a little bit more. I think I can back this up authoritatively. Uh, most federal politicians, these are my colleagues, and they're good people, and they're great at getting elected and reelected. But the amount of time spent on legislating approaches zero. The old job, I've been around for almost a quarter of a century on Capitol Hill, the old job was legislation and casework. Casework was how you got your political juice back home. You make people happy by cutting through red tape and getting them their Social Security check on time. The new job in Congress, and our new sort of market approach is 75% of your time fundraising for your re-election campaign and the remainder of the time handing out earmarks, which is our theft of your taxpayer money to build our political machines back home. The average freshman congressman gets $50 million to do that. Not in one year, but over a two-year cycle. You can build quite a machine for $50 million. And we allow that to go on, even though that practice really was non-existent 10 or 15 years ago. That's how quickly the world has changed on your watch as you've come of age. So don't assume this is the way it's always been. Now, Congress has always been a laughing stock to a greater or lesser degree, but seldom have we been on steroids the way we have become lately. This is the book that John mentioned earlier. Uh, it's not a bestseller, <laughs> never was intended. It's actually available free online because all it is is a reprint of a government document but one that you've never seen before. It's a government document done by the U.S. Treasury Department that they put out on Christmas Eve without a press release. Fewer people in Congress are briefed on this document than are briefed on the ultra-secret NSA wiretapping. What is this document? This is the annual report for America. Now, not with my name on it. That's what something the publisher did. It's basically using real accounting to describe America as a business. And it's completely official. Hank Paulson signs the cover page, just like all previous secretaries of Treasury have signed it. Now, this didn't exist about 10 years ago. But in the last 10 years, it's actually become quite a remarkable document. Because there's certain things that are different about government. How do you depreciate or value military equipment? Well, we figured out that puzzle. Other puzzles have been figured out. Now it's a pretty darn good authoritative document. But you've never seen it. And you are some of the top business students in America. If you get your favorite company's annual report, why don't you get your favorite country's annual report? Because there are too many politicians in Washington who don't want you to see it. Because the news is so bad. Let me give you an example. For those of you who've worked in the private sector, you know if you were to omit your employees' health and retirement benefits from the financial statements, you could go to jail. Well, the federal government doesn't put federal employee retirement on our balance sheet. It's free, isn't it? You know, we break every rule in accounting. But of course, we can't go to jail because we make the laws and we make sure we don't go to jail. But this is an amazing phenomenon. Every budget you've ever heard, President Bush, who's our first MBA president in American history, or any other politician mentioned, has used cash numbers. It is illegal to use cash accounting in America if you have revenues over $5 million. That basically means if you're larger than a single standalone McDonald's, you can't use cash accounting. But we use it for the largest enterprise on this earth. Why do we do that? We don't want you to know about the $70 trillion. Let's go back a bit. This says our problems are worsening at the rate of 3 to $4 trillion a year. Now, that's hard even for a business student to wrap their mind around because that means to get ahead of that problem, if you assume it takes Congress a year to do most anything, 
a reform proposal would have to save more than three or four trillion dollars to even get ahead of the game slightly. The risk here is that it's an irreversible problem. You know, like global warming and if the icebergs on Greenland melt and the ocean levels rise, how do you put the icebergs back on top of Greenland? That's a hard thing to do. How do you stop a runaway deficit problem that's worsening at the rate of three to four trillion a year? It becomes nightmarishly difficult. And yet we have to solve the problem because we have to rescue the greatest nation on earth. And these are numbers, you know, not for me, these are audited numbers, the only audited numbers in the Washington debate, and audited by the Comptroller General of the United States, David Walker. He says our problems are 50 trillion, but he then, if you read the fine print, says, well, that doesn't count Medicaid and a bunch of other programs, and they think Medicaid is at least 30 trillion. So 70 trillion is probably a, a, an underestimation. So this is the situation you are in. Business students above all should know about it. President Bush should be willing to talk about it because he was trained at Harvard, no less, to be expert in issues like this. I've had this discussion with Hank Paulson, who's a fabulous business executive, former head of Goldman Sachs, and yet he's acting like a child in Washington, being handheld by the political operatives instead of telling the truth. Do you think he could have gotten away with cash accounting in the M&A business at Goldman Sachs? I don't think so. Well, why is he letting America get away with it? This is a key chart for your generation. It's from the back of the CBO report. It shows by age cohort your basic return on Social Security. Uh, it becomes negative if you were born after 1938. It stays negative forever. These folks got a magnificent windfall, and those are our parents and grandparents. And no one of us would begrudge that, but this is not the way that you would design a sensible benefits program. The miracle is that Congress was able to stop that mountain from growing any higher. But we have to redesign Social Security to have a chance of helping your generation get a better deal there. That alone would have been enough reason to mob Bill Thomas's car. Here's a radical proposal. Since politicians in Washington love tax cuts, how do you package a reform proposal like I'm interested in, like candy? Because nobody will voluntarily go eat a lot of broccoli. Well, this is a candy proposal. The Social Security payroll tax that you're paying is 12.4%, employer and employee share. And of course, you realize that real economics says the employee pays the whole load. Uh, the employer is just a pass-through device. We could cut that to 9% for the next 10 years, not hurt Social Security because that extra 3.4% tax is not being spent on Social Security. It's being spent on everything but Social Security, the war, you name it, and we're letting politicians get away with it. Every presidential candidate in this election, Democrat and Republican, and Libertarian, Count Ron Paul, their business plan is to take $1.5 trillion of Social Security trust fund money and spend it on other things. Otherwise, they won't have any money to do anything with in their administration. President Bush will have taken a trillion from the trust fund. President Clinton took about 600 billion. The amounts have been accumulating. But they basically all taken as much as was available. If you were to cut the payroll tax, you wouldn't be increasing the debt of the country. You'd just be switching lenders. Because today, the United States of America has a delightful captive lender in the Social Security Trust Fund. And if you were to say, hey, uh, borrow this from the market, there'd be much more market discipline. But the Social Security Trust Fund never says, oops, I'm worried about your fiscal policies. We might charge a higher rate. They just are totally compliant. So when President Bush, like he did a month ago, has a press conference saying the deficit's smaller than expected, it's only $150 billion, he is not telling you that he borrowed $200 billion from Social Security to make it look smaller than $350 billion and that that $350 billion did not include federal employee health and retirement benefits, did not include veterans benefits, did not include Social Security, did not include Medicare, basically all the major programs in America. It's a ridiculous joke number, but too many of our business friends are not perceptive enough to understand the way the government plays games with the numbers. This, I'm afraid, is your generation writ large. It's also my generation, but they're too young to look like me. Uh, I mentioned the earlier mortal temptation of that credit card. 
They had a recent roll call article, that's the congressional newspaper, how many congressmen have perpetual $50,000 debts on their credit cards. $50,000 they're rolling over at 18, 21% interest. This is dumber than dirt. This is how you draw Congress. You've probably seen this sign. You don't see as many on the back of cars as you used to. But you haven't seen this one for Congress. Because all Congress is is an organized appetite. I call it Santa Claus. I have this sticker on the front of my desk so that everybody who's asking me for money can see it. And precious few people know the irony. Well, we're not Santa Claus. I wish we were. That would be a fun job. But Santa Claus, you know, was able to invent things. We, money doesn't grow on trees for us. But yet, that's the way most people treat us. The irony of lobbying in Washington today is people are leaving rich and prosperous county and state jurisdictions to travel to Washington, which is now the poorest level of government, at least as measured by balance sheets. And they're coming to ask us for money. We had a visitor this year from the ninth richest county in America who wanted a new national park in his county. But he flew 500 miles to ask the poorest level of government for the money. It makes no sense. But see, people aren't thinking. They're just following the old habits. If you want big money, you go to Washington. And to be sure, there's plenty of money sloshing around Washington. And they think they can catch some of it in a bucket and bring it back home. But that's not exactly good government. Here, you're going to think, well, Cooper's exaggerating. I've never heard of Cooper anyway. Well, this is from Standard & Poor's. You've heard of them. This is their current projection for the future of the US T-bond. It loses its AAA rating by 2012. That's when the next president's trying to get reelected. Then pretty soon, as you can see, we'll have the same credit rating as Mexico. That's before the next president completes their second term. How many folks do you think can get reelected, or how many political parties can survive if you have so destroyed America's credit rating and destroyed the most important piece of paper in the world, the T-bond, by these irresponsible policies? You know what Hank Paulson's reaction to this is? Well, some politician will intervene. I said, well, Hank, how about you? You're the Secretary of Treasury. He said, well, it just isn't going to happen in this administration. Well, when is it going to happen? You think a new president is going to be able to solve the problem? Well, we all need to hope and pray they will be able to. We'll be at junk bond status by 2025. So we'll have gone from the most secure instrument in the world to below investment grade in just about 10 years while you're building your business careers. That's why it's not only an interesting option for you to join government, it's, it may be essential. I have sponsored this thing. It's in the newspaper today, the Cooper Wolf Commission. Frank Wolf is actually the guy who got the Iraq study group going and had a hand in the 9-11 commission. We shouldn't have to do commissions in Washington. It's an embarrassing cop-out. But if you're not doing it on your own, and we're two months from Iowa and New Hampshire primaries, this is probably the best we can do. So that the new president would have a bipartisan agreement on what radical steps should be taken, the three or four trillion dollar a year reform steps. So that's what we're working on. The key element of this whole thing, we wouldn't have big problems if it weren't for our health care system. And it's primarily the uncontrolled and unproductive growth in health care. So let me delve into this a little bit. And I know certain people have already taken a class, like Jane Kim, is already expert on all this. So I'm going to do this at 90 miles an hour. So I apologize. This is really a semester-long course. But I just want to give you some of the basics. The US health care system would be the fourth largest country in the world if it were a separate country. This is the fundamental equation in healthcare. This is from Paul Starr, who's a Princeton sociologist, an amazing thinker on healthcare. It's a truism. Two trillion always equals two trillion. But see, from a political standpoint, those two trillion dollars over here, those are vested interest dollars. Not one penny of that will ever be admitted to by any industry participant as being wasted. We get asked to do moratoriums all the time to prevent cuts. And some moratoriums are now in their 26th year. You know, if they were honest, they'd say, kill the program. And they say, oh, just another two-year moratorium, and we'll be fine. Meanwhile, it's growing completely out of control. Medicare alone is $32 trillion of the problem. If you had to visualize the US healthcare system, what kind is it? It's not slim and efficient, like most of Europe or Japan. Public health, we look down on, even though this might be the most um, best return for our health care dollars. We have more of a concierge, valet, limo driver system. And that's what all upper income people want. 
And by the way, hotshot Wall Street executives are more likely to have zero copays and deductibles than any other people in America because they don't always get the board to reimburse it, even if theoretically their health plan has a copay or deductible. First dollar coverage is not good insurance. That's unaffordable insurance. This is one of the fundamental misconceptions that most Americans make. They assume that the middle class is in the middle. Well, it's this. Is it fat man's belly or is it really fat ankles? I'm afraid our society like, looks like really fat ankles because most of us are down here. Now, some fortunate few of you may make it to the neck of the lacrosse stick. Now, Bill Gates would be up there or Warren Buffett. But if we were to draw this lacrosse stick right here and I had the base at my feet, Bill Gates would be three stories above us. And God bless him. I don't envy his money. But we, when we legislate, we have to understand where most people are. And the folks who basically have been held stagnant and their wages are right down here. And they're not a great distance from the homeless people right down here. But we in our own minds have this illusion of ourselves that somehow we're, we're in the middle. These are the numbers. 32 trillion for Medicare, roughly 30 trillion for Medicaid, but we don't even have the analytical tools to measure the Medicaid problem. We had a hearing on this Thursday in Washington, the Government Reform Committee. I pointed this out. Nobody wanted to hear it. They just wanted to beat up on the administration for not spending more money. Well, I said, well, where's the money going to come from? Do we want to go bankrupt faster? Are you familiar with the Einstein phrase? The most powerful force on Earth is not nuclear power. It's compound interest. The employer-sponsored health care system is breaking down. President Bush is the first president in history to basically admit that in a State of the Union speech. We're doing nothing about it. 47 million uninsured. Doctors are flooding Washington this year for this thing called the SGR fix. That would basically hold the unit price of Medicare reimbursement constant. But it's a volume price trade-off. Business students are familiar with that. Volume has shot through the roof. That's why unit price is edging down. Not to punish doctors, but to keep them at existing levels of compensation. Doctors don't understand the volume unit price trade-off. They want unit price kept up high. The cost of the unit price fix, according to the US Treasury Department, is $5 trillion. And that's for a freeze. If we give them a 1% or 2% bump, it's $7 trillion. And doctors are smart people. None of them have been told about this. And we could repeat the 2003 Medicare drug bill mistake, the $8 trillion mistake, by passing a five to seven trillion mistake, and most of Congress wouldn't even know what they were doing. Now, no one is talking large numbers like this because we usually talk about one or two year band-aids, but those are the real numbers if you want to fix the problem as the AMA and all doctor groups not only suggest but demand. This is what, the way your Medicare system looks today. This is a slide from the Commonwealth Foundation. If you draw a line through the data, normalize the results, you'll see the Tennessee's down here but you see an inverse relationship. The relationship should be positive. That's how out of whack the largest healthcare system in America or the world is. We don't even have the basic relationship right. Look at this. This shows, and this has been true for 40 years now, since the program was started in the 1960s, the darker areas are the highest reimbursement. Miami, Florida gets triple the reimbursement of Minneapolis triple, and the people in Minneapolis are healthier. Well, why do you get paid more? Any of you who go into healthcare, all your healthcare companies, where is their first test operation going to be? In Minneapolis or Miami? If they have any Medicare patients at all, it's going to be in Miami or in one of these red areas down here. Well, why does that imbalance exist? It doesn't make any sense at all. And this is a multi-trillion dollar cross-subsidy that we just allow perpetuate. And because Texas has a lot of congressmen and Florida, it's very hard to do something about. Are you all familiar with Medigap insurance? That's insurance that seniors buy to eliminate the copay and deductible that Medicare would otherwise require. Well, if you think about it, that's predatory insurance. That raises overall Medicare costs by 20, 30 percent, according to most academic literature. I mentioned that to the Trade Association. They said, oh, Congressman, you're completely wrong. We'll sh we've got a paper on that. We'll show you. Well, a few weeks later, I get the paper. I read it. And they said, well, we raise Medicare prices 15 percent. 15 percent on $426 billion is over $60 billion a year. 
that the trade association admitted to. And that's an engraved invitation for us to regulate and say, hey, let's not get rid of Medigap coverage, but let's make it more constructive so it's not predatory. So it doesn't eliminate the copays and deductibles. Maybe it fills in a catastrophic benefit that's needed or a nursing home benefit or other benefit that would be very helpful to a senior. But here's the trade association admitting, oops, we're creating problems of $60 billion plus. And I've been unable to find anybody in Congress who understands enough about Medigap and this relationship to do anything about. So there's a lost $60 billion annual savings just right there. This is a slide one of my students gave me this year. I love it because, you know, placebos work 50% of the time. Placebo is a sugar pill. It's worthless, right? But because it engages the mind and the healing powers of the mind, it's amazingly effective. There's been a New York Times article on placebo surgery. And while there are ethical difficulties in getting permission for that, they've discovered that the more stitches, more blood and guts, even though nothing was done inside the patient, it has incredible therapeutic powers. Because people believe they were operated on and their doctor helped them. This is a part of medicine we haven't begun to explore. The drug ads on TV. These did not exist before 1998. And your generation is so accustomed to these 30-second physicians, like yourselves, who go into a physician and demand a medicine, even though it may have nothing to do with your condition. It's become the norm. And as I say, before 1998, no one was played with these. Now it's a $5 billion a year industry. My classmate from Harvard Law School is now the head of Pfizer, Jeff Kindler. I haven't quite gotten the opportunity to discuss it with, <laughs> this with him. But, you know, it works from a business standpoint, but does it work from an American budget standpoint? When some of the Super Bowl ads didn't even mention the body part that a given medicine would affect. But physicians will tell you that people come in demanding that medicine, even though they have a different body part that problem. This is the fundamental relationship. The reason it's hard to solve our health care problems because a physician, economist, and patient have completely different views of the system. You can comprehend marginal benefit. Most physicians cannot. You know, they'll basically give you meds until it actively harms you, whereas you want to make sure that marginal cost equals marginal benefit. And the patient, really all they care about is out of pocket. So this is the fundamental problem. How do you get these people locked in a room and have a successful negotiation? You've seen graphs like this, and I won't dwell on this. It's probably too painful. It reminds you of class. But it's that curve you've got to get the right angle on. This is my own invention. This is a map of the whole US healthcare system. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Uh, I doubt you have either. Uh, this shows you one picture, and you can find yourself on the map. These are age cohorts. If you're 20-something, you're in here. And if you're upper income, you're up toward the top. So you're in this private insurance pool, a good, comfortable place to be. But the trajectory for your whole life is something like this. If you live a long time, you might make it to here. Oh, those of us who are in their 50s find it very depressing, the steep slope downward at this point. As they say in Britain, when you turn 55, everyone gets a little bit crumbly. But here you see the program for the poor, Medicaid, which does a much better job for poor kids. You can actually be half the poverty level here, especially if you're childless, and really get almost no help from the government. Medicare kicks in regardless of your income level here. And the saddest place to be in America is right there. 60-something, poor, and you get no help from anybody. There's this vast floating pool of uninsured people. Now it's 47 million. And that can be described, but most Americans don't even realize. We actually have a, a whole program, of, of an encyclopedia of programs devoted for those people. Having looked at the government programs, you need to look at yourselves, too. It could be all our fault. The current leading data today, which Jacob Hacker at Yale and other folks don't like to talk about, because we've talked about it, is the average American will declare bankruptcy now over $3,600 in health expenses. Total episode of illness, $11,000. That's cheaper than a mediocre used car, and people will declare bankruptcy in this country over that. That basically means, and if any of you want to win a prize, you know, it's not a gift and good. What is it? This is something that people don't think they have to pay for. And they're not paying for it. These bills are incredibly hard to collect because they think health care should be free in this country. There's no constitutional right for it. Perhaps there should be if we could afford it. But people have gone ahead and said, hey, I'm not paying that bill. You know, it's amazing 
the low level of, uh, of bankruptcy expenses. Here is a quick engine. Folks in my class are tired of seeing it, but you wonder why healthcare costs go up. If you're an employee and you put in one dollar, your employer matches it three for one, a very typical thing. Suddenly, your one dollar is worth four. You run it through this tax break machine and the four dollars becomes eight dollars and twenty cents. And then everybody knows private coverage pays a lot better than government programs. Everybody wants privately insured patients. So that really pays 120% of costs. So the $8 comes into 943. So if you're a provider, do you want to deal direct with a worker here and take a dollar because it would equal a dollar, go direct? Or do you want to run it through the siphon and have $1 become $9.43? That's better than ancient alchemy, turning straw into gold. And that's what we've done with our private health system. And if you think this is bad, I'll show you Medicare and Medicaid. This is how it works, and this is probably at this late hour on a beautiful day, too much to go through, so I won't belabor y'all with that. Um, am I exaggerating? This is Reggie Herzlinger, Harvard. This is from her book. How did the healthcare system get into this mess? Two obscure tax code provisions caused the whole problem. Now, she's a little bit of a free market person for some, but she's a Harvard authority, the name authority, and this is in her book. So, I don't think I'm exaggerating. This is like my standard and poor's nail it down citation for this section of the talk. There are other areas we could talk about if you want. I'm actually chairman of a panel now in Washington that's incredibly exciting because it would reorganize all of the Pentagon, the State Department, the CIA, and the NSC. About every 30 years this happens in America. Why? Because we screw up so badly we have to reorganize things. And that's what we're involved in here. And there are different ways of conceptualizing that. Um, I won't belabor this. This is one of the intriguing things, and this is, has a lot to do with business school. I don't know if you saw the current issue of The New Yorker. I've decided to pursue a military career in the private sector. Blackwater and 170 other companies are basically such a threat to our active duty military today that Secretary of Defense Bob Gates has suggested that we may have to put non-compete clauses in our standard military sign-up paperwork just so our best soldiers don't get stolen by the private sector. I asked Eric Prince, who's the CEO of Blackwater and Solo, or the company, he looked very patriotic. I said, well, how do we know? Is it in the company charter? You'd only work for the U.S. or U.S. interest? He said, oh, you know, trust me. I said, well, what if you die? And he said, well, I have five kids. Trust them. I said, well, don't you have any lawyers? Can't you put it in the charter? You'd only work for U.S. companies or interests. He hadn't gone there yet. And he denies they're mercenaries, but what are they? if they won't put it in ink, that they will only support U.S. interests. A three-star general told me last week that he's much more afraid of being shot by a Blackwater employee in downtown Baghdad than he is being shot by an Iraqi. That's pretty scary when the folks were paying $300,000 a year each versus a soldier at $30,000 is a greater threat to our three-star generals than an Iraqi. We're speaking in a law school building, but most of you are business students. I won't dwell on this. Um, but if you really want a multidisciplinary education, you need to get a joint degree so you understand some of these constitutional things that we are hopelessly trampling. Like, why do you think most detainees were put in Guantanamo? Well, courtesy of the Cuban dictator, Fidel Castro, it was a lawless area of the planet. Perhaps after Antarctica, the only other lawless area of the planet. And Antarctica is a little cold. It's unbelievable that we would stake our national and international prestige, a quarter of a millennium of good relations with the rest of the world, on finding the one lawless place on the planet. And of course, the Supreme Court slapped it down. Seven of the nine justices appointed by Republicans in a heartbeat, in a unanimous decision, think we do not do business this way. More and more Americans need to tune in to our Constitution because most folks in politics and the media would tell you today, we couldn't pass the Bill of Rights today. There's so little familiarity with those advanced concepts that have led the greatest nation. Some other things, this is a small little thing. It's mainly of interest because this is a company run by two Harvard Business School grads. I found this in a little line item going through some boring military paperwork, a suspicious $10 million. That's nothing in Washington. That's a rounding error. I was ridiculed by my uh, committee members saying, Cooper, they're just helping our troops. Don't worry about it. But I saw it was a Florida venture capital company that was getting this money. I thought maybe, well, this is a Jeb Bush thing. I was unduly cynical. Um, it wasn't going to a Jeb Bush friend. It was uh, a wily lobbyist who'd gotten first a $25 million deal with the Pentagon. 
And it was a deal, it wasn't an investment, it was a gift to this company. But their true imagination kicked in when they figured out um, a sweep account inside the Pentagon. So they ended up getting $71 million. If there's any research money left in the Pentagon, it automatically went to this one Florida company. Half of that proceeds was for fees. They claimed top quartile performance, but I can show you it was guaranteed to be the worst in America. Because it was a gift, it wasn't an investment. The government got back nothing in return. This is run by Harvard Business School people. That's why I asked that fundamental question at the start. Would you buy what you were selling if you're at this company? You know, the only reason they asked for the $10 million was so they could have more fee income. You know, it, this is an amazing thing. I complained about this to the dean of Harvard Law School. She was appalled that Harvard people were doing this. Nobody from any business school should be involved in this. I mentioned Cuba earlier. If you want to look at a policy screw-up in this country, maybe some of you all are, are Cubans and have different feelings, but has our policy worked since Eisenhower is today? Castro's not very healthy, but he's still there. You know, embargoes have not been the most successful policy in history. We have huge trade problems today. America is going protectionist. Your generation could be hopelessly damaged by that, but protectionism is popular. The front of the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago said that two-thirds of Republicans are now tending protectionist. But you don't understand fundamental economics. The benefits annually of free trade are like a trillion dollars. The benefits. The cost is about 50 billion in dislocation, which is a huge cost, but it's dwarfed by the benefits. And America's remedial programs for helping are about $2 billion a year. Now, if this were drawn to scale, this block would be even bigger. It would be off the slide. So are we going to allow the tail to wag the dog here and allow small dislocation to outweigh huge benefits? Well, that's precisely what we're doing today. In summary, uh, a lot of folks view the congressional job this way, and I want to encourage you not only to work for government, but to be government, run for Congress. How many of y'all are 25 already? You're old enough to run for Congress. 30, you can run for Senate. 35, you can run for President. Uh, you can evolve. This is one way to look at the job. I think that's uh, reasonably objective um, is what it involves. But I think this short changes the, the idealism of it. The better description is this. The world's only superpower needs a wise board of directors. And we need folks like you to consider uh, running for these jobs. Because when was the last election you participated in? There's so many good candidates you just couldn't pick. You know, at best, it's a lesser of evils choice, and sometimes it's evil versus evil. That is our fault. When our country was founded, the best people in America participated in public life. There weren't a lot of better Americans than John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, folks like that. Well, where are they today? The answer is they're at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, a few hedge funds, and companies that you're going to work for. And history will never have heard of you because you didn't get in the arena. I think Washington's worth the trip. I hope you will too. But remember, it's not just Washington. It's your state capital. It's your city hall. You should also be looking at too. I hope you'll take the challenge. Thanks for letting me talk to you today. I'd be happy to field questions. I don't want to wear people out, especially on a, a beautiful afternoon. But anyone's got one, I accept answers, too. We're always. You mentioned uh, that the changes in, in the policy that you have to make to the Well, this is one of those things where I love capitalism. I love markets. I love commercialism. But there should be limits to everything. It's like basketball. There needs to be a free throw line, and there needs to be a certain goal height, and there needs to be an out of bounds, and there need to be referees. We have very few referees anymore. And since we are all considered sovereign members, each member is equal, who's going to discipline us? When I first went to Congress, I asked Tip O'Neill, who was then speaker, you know, see how old I am. But I was the youngest congressman in America. I said, where is the ethics book for Congress? And he put his big arm around me and said, Jimmy, my boy. He had a better Irish accent than that. Yeah, you don't understand. You don't want an ethics book, because that makes it easier for them to catch you. Well, gradually, we've acquired an ethics book, but it's so silly. You know, 
if you own your own private plane today, they made it illegal for you to fly in your own plane. Because they're so afraid you might be seduced by a lobbyist who had a plane that you couldn't even allow yourself to fly in your own plane. It's insane. So all we're doing is driving good people out of public life. For example, most of you, once you're in the business world for a while, you won't want to disclose your assets. And you won't want the world picking at you. And that's the greatest barrier to entry that we have, could have ever created, because it means that uh, we never have to worry about millionaires running against us. So we need to tear down some of these barriers. But it's basically been a mistaken application of market principles and capitalism. I'm not against that. I'm past the first cap and trade provision in American history in the 1990 Clean Air Act for sulfur dioxide trading. It's a case study in, I think, every business school in America in terms of effective environmental regulation. But there are limits to everything. And we've forgotten our limits in this country, it seems to me. Anybody else want to bring up something? Yes? I think they're a simplistic and counterproductive solution. Uh, properly understood, we have term limits every two years. Uh, if you were to have, say, a six-year term limit, all that would do is recycle inferior, mediocre politicians through the system faster so that they could end up being on K Street, which is today, sadly, the goal of most of them. Because Congress is no longer a destination, it's a stepping stone. There are members of Congress elected today whose first vote is calculated, well, how do I get to be head of the Cellular Telephone Association, or the Motion Picture Association, or the Chemical Industry Association? Uh, that is a tragedy. I wish we had more, you know, a better reform in terms, and this would be over-inclusive the other way, would be life tenure like federal judges. Now, we would never seriously propose that, but term limits basically means more irresponsibility at the polls you don't have to keep up with the election because you know in six years whoever the turkey is will be replaced probably by another turkey. And is, is that progress? Because sadly today for your generation, the permanent government isn't Congress in Washington. It's K Street. And you don't even know their names. This is most heavily visualized by the Congressional Country Club. Any golfers in the room? They have great golf tournaments there. The Open was there just this last year. It's a fabulous country club golf course. And it's called Congressional. So everybody back home thinks we belong there, right? Uh -uh. I don't know any congressman who can afford it or wait out the eight-year waiting list. It's the lobbyist country club. It just is improperly named because they're the ones who hold the memberships and have the tenure and are in Washington for 30 years, say, making $2 million a year. A freshman or new graduate from Harvard Law School today makes more money starting out for a New York law firm than I make as a congressman. And I'm proud for them to make a lot of money. People do not go into what I do uh, for money. You know, and that's, uh, it'll probably always be that way because it's called democracy. But somehow we need to attract talent into government. Do you think George Washington complained about the salary for Thomas Jefferson? He died basically bankrupt. You know, it's, see, we just have a different standard. We measure our success by money and toys. There have to be higher standards than that. Think of the condemnation of history. If you inherited the greatest country on earth and then it fell apart on your watch, I wouldn't want to be part of that generation. Winston Churchill went through a similar thing. Almost all of his speeches for 60 years, he said, I will not preside over the destruction of the British Empire. And that is precisely what he did. Now, he complained the whole time, but that didn't make it better. We need policies that result in strength not weakness. And in countless areas, we're not seeing that. Anybody else want to bring up something? Yeah, PJ? I, uh, I know that you uh, have a message in this area. You guys can do something else again. How do we as voters go out and evaluate uh, people that are running, whether it's on the federal level or on the state level? Um, how, do we, how do you suggest that we go out and evaluate properly? Well, you're one of the ones in the room who know most about the political process, and you know that most politicians basically not tell the whole truth as they're campaigning. If you want proof of that, 
look at all the presidential candidates' health reform proposals. It's basically all candy, no spinach. That's what you sadly have to do today to get elected. So it takes not only leaders, it also takes followers who are willing to follow. And there's so many groups in America today who will not follow anything that we've allowed the followers to replace leaders. And uh, that means you almost have to be a CIA agent to figure out what a candidate really thinks on an issue. You have to know their inside group, you have to know their history, their biases. And it's a very difficult process. Um, presidential candidates get a lot of scrutiny, but it's mainly on foibles, not on genuine philosophical beliefs. Many Americans today wouldn't have a philosophical belief if it bit them in the leg. You know, just reading the Federalist Papers is more advanced than most of our graduate students can handle today. Because these were folks who were steeped in the classics, who were familiar with, you know, French thinkers, German thinkers, British thinkers. You know, could we have a debate in this room between, you know, Hobbes and Locke? Or uh, do you have a Burkean view of the world? You know, these are words that meant something in the 1700s and 1800s. And today, you know, it'd be easier to have a college class on The Simpsons and their impact on daily life or King of the Hill or things like that. I know that's what my kids watch. You know, and, you know, your generation doesn't like to hear that, but there's a rigor that's been lost and a discipline. You know, when we don't even have a savings rate, like a wonderful book now called The Price of Liberty by Roger Hormatz, Goldman Sachs banker. Saying, this is the first war in American history we didn't even try to pay for. So we're letting the Chinese pay for us to fight, actually so that we can hire more Blackwater people to do a lot of the real security protection. This is nonsensical, and the Chinese are smart enough to know that. You know, there are more English speakers in China today than there are in this country. And the Chinese I know who speak English usually speak better English than we do. And we shouldn't be envious of that. We should realize this is a wake-up call, folks. And we're not responding. You know, y'all will get an 8,000 square foot house. You'll have two BMWs. You'll have really nice vacations in the Caribbean. You'll contribute somewhat generously to your uh, alma mater. You'll have a nice family and we'll be in a declining country. It's going to take more to be a citizen in your generation than it has taken before. Because you've got to make up for our mistakes. I just Lisa? Have to say I didn't realize you were as hardcore as I am. That's amazing. I, I suggest that every day in my house. And I, it's child abuse under current standards. You know, it's just, it's incomprehensible. Uh, and yet, it's not a bad way to uh, be raised. Anybody else? I, I don't want to wear you out or, or seem too puritanical. To, I mean, it's, uh, I apologize in a short dose to try to convey so much information in a short time. Any final words, Mary? Yes, sir. Well, to me, nothing is more urgent than this. That gets me out of bed in the morning. Nothing is more exciting than to try to save the greatest country in the history of the world. You know, I hope I will always be open-minded enough so that you say, hey, Cooper, you're off base here a lot or a little. I'll be open-minded to that. But I know of no refutation to this. And I've checked it out with some pretty influential folks. Like, 
Hank Paulson doesn't challenge me on the merits of this. You know, my friends who work with, work with him at Goldman don't challenge me on the merits. So financially, I think I'm on pretty secure ground. I know healthcare about as well as anybody in the country. Um, now, some other areas, it's, you can have quibbles on defense views or things like that, but it's, it's a little bit scary, folks. So um, was Paul Revere happy about his job? I don't know what his self-esteem was. I don't care. But he warned us in time. And enough people were willing to listen. Now, it's presumptuous for me to equate myself with a guy on horseback a long time ago. But to me, these signs sh should be screamingly obvious. But another thing that your generation is deprived of, it's not just good television. It's actually, in general, you're surrounded by such a degraded medium that it's hard for you to find out the facts on anything. The New York Times has lowered its uh, literacy level from 11th grade to 8th grade. If that trend continues, it'll pretty soon be at 6th grade, and that's the New York Times. I was on Fox the other night, Hannity and Combs, and why did they want me on TV? It wasn't for anything substantive. Sean Hannity wanted to beat up on Al Gore for having won the Nobel Peace Prize, and I'm a known Gore partisan, so I was there defending him. Sean Hannity's line of attack was first, uh, what was it? Um, you wouldn't want this prize because Yasser Arafat won it. And that's the argument of guilt by association because the Swedish judges might have picked one bad person one year. It's, it's a worthless prize. Well, I said, Sean, would you turn it down? Yeah. In the unlikely event that you won it. You know, uh, <laughs> you know Mother Teresa won this prize. Lekwalesa, Nelson Mandela. You know, it's a pretty amazing prize. The other big argument was, well, Al Gore flies in private jets. His carbon footprint is too big. So that's not a sin or a crime, is it? Sean Hannity flies in private jets. You know, maybe Al buys carbon offsets. I don't know. But do you want to kill the messenger here? Would Sean Hannity give Al Gore more respect if Al bicycled from destination to destination? No. You know, this is a political attack job. And in my opinion, at least, the more Rupert Murdoch owns of our media, the more dangerous it is. And you know, how many of y'all have been to England and read the British tabloids? And especially the women in the audience seen the way he sells newspapers by what's on page three. You know, that's what sadly sells. And that's what I'm afraid. He won't do it to the Wall Street Journal, at least not immediately. But I just see this general dumbing down. And if you don't know what the facts are, how do we avoid a Tower of Babel situation? You know, I spend most of my time every day trying to find the facts on the fact sheets, because there aren't any. These are spin sheets handed to you by lobbyists who want to persuade you. And to actually get to the real information takes a lot of work. But this probably need to be it. Thank you for coming out today. I hope you have a great rest of Net Impact. And thank you for coming to Nashville.